Cambridge IGCSE Chemistry Major 2020, Paper 63. Question 1. A sample of rock salt contains sodium chloride and sand. Sodium chloride is soluble in water, sand is insoluble in water. A student obtained dry crystals of pure sodium chloride from a lump of rock salt. These are some of the steps the student used. Step 1. He grinded the rock salt into smaller pieces. Step 2. The rock salt was added to water and heat with while stirring with a glass rod. So you see this lump, it's probably just sand because sodium chloride is soluble in water. Then step 3, it was filtered, so sand was left here as the residue. And this liquid is probably sodium chloride plus water. Part A, name the apparatus labeled A in step 1. Okay, for this kind of questions, you have to know the answer beforehand. It's called a mortar. Part B. Explain why the mixture is heated and stirred in step 2. It's so that sodium chloride can dissolve in water quickly so that you don't have to wait forever for it to dissolve. Part C. Name the apparatus labeled B in step 3. It's this one looking like a triangle here and the stick. It's the funnel where you put the filter paper and the residue is left on top. State the scientific term for the sand left on the filter paper in step 3. It's this one. It's called a residue. Part D. Describe what the student must do after step 3 to obtain dry crystals of pure sodium chloride. So in step 3, you got this mixture, which is the mixture of water and sodium chloride. In order to get crystals of pure sodium chloride, you need to do crystallization. The process of crystallization is you first put this mixture in an evaporating basin and start heating it. Well, you can, you know, just evaporate it off, but that's going to take forever. So you just heat it to speed up the process to the point of crystallization. So you don't heat it until you burn everything. You can stop heating once you think that it's starting to crystallize. And then you cool it down and filter it one more time just to make sure that it's just pure sodium chloride and dry it with filter paper. So you just wipe off the remaining liquid or whatever that's left on its surface. This is the full process of crystallization and you have to memorize all the processes. Question 2. A student investigated the temperature change when aqueous sodium hydroxide neutralizes dilute hydrochloric acid. The equation for the reaction is shown. Sodium hydroxide, which is base, is added with hydrochloric acid, which is an acid, and sodium chloride is produced, the salt, and water. Eight experiments were done. Experiment 1. A polystyrene cup was placed into a 250 cm cube beaker for support. Using a measuring cylinder, 5 cm cube of aqueous sodium hydroxide was poured into the polystyrene cup. Using a measuring cylinder, 45 cm cube of dilute hydrochloric acid was poured into the polystyrene cup. The mixture was stirred and the maximum temperature reached was measured using a thermometer. The polystyrene cup was rinsed with distilled water. Okay, experiment 2. Experiment 1 was repeated using 10 cm cube of aqueous sodium hydroxide and 40 cm cube of dilute hydrochloric acid. So they're just changing the volumes of sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid used. For sodium hydroxide, it was 5, then increased to 10, 15, 20, and so on. Then for hydrochloric acid, it was 45, then decreased to 40, 35, and so on. Part A. Use the formula in the description of the experiments and the thermometer diagrams to complete the table. Volume of dilute hydrochloric acid. It's given here, you just have to copy that down from 45 to 5. Then the highest temperature reached, it's here, just read the thermometer diagram. It's 23, 25, 27, 29. 30, 28, 26, and 24. Part B. Plot the results from experiments 1 to 8 on the grid. Draw two straight lines through the points. Extend your straight lines so that they cross. 
So we have to plot the highest temperature reached against the volume of aqueous sodium hydroxide and draw two straight lines. Well, right now we won't know what kind of two straight lines they're talking about, so let's first plot the points. They have already put the scale for it. Very nice, you don't have to do it. Just plot the points according to the table above. The points are plotted, and now it's quite obvious what kind of two straight lines they're talking about. One is like this, and the other one like this. Remember, we have to extend our line so that they cross. Part C, the point on the graph where the two straight lines cross is where all of the aqueous sodium hydroxide reacts with all of the dilute hydrochloric acid to form a neutral solution. Use your graph to deduce the volume of aqueous sodium hydroxide and the volume of dilute hydrochloric acid that react together to produce a neutral solution. Show your working on the grid. Well, since they've told us that the point where they cross is where all of the sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid react together to form a neutral solution, then we just have to write the coordinate of the intersecting point. Draw a straight vertical line downwards and see where it meets the x-axis. So this is around 26.5. 26.5 cm cube of aqueous sodium hydroxide was used, and to find the volume of dilute hydrochloric acid, you need to use the table above. Since the volume of sodium hydroxide was around 26.5, it's between 20 and 30, so the volume of hydrochloric acid used should be somewhere between 30 and 20. If this was 26.5, Actually, this value depends on the graph. It doesn't have to be 26.5, but for me it is. So I would say for the volume of hydrochloric acid should be around 23.5. Since this is from 20 to 30, and this is from 30 to 20. So I'll just put it as 23.5. Use your graph to determine the highest temperature reached if the volumes in part C1 were mixed together. If they're mixed together and the highest temperature reached, this is over here. We just have to read the y-coordinate of the intersection. It's around 31.4. Don't forget the unit. One mark is for the figure and one mark is for the unit. Which solution, aqueous sodium hydroxide or dilute hydrochloric acid, was the most concentrated? Use your answer to part C1 to explain why. Our answer in part C1, which were these, and which was more concentrated? Since the volume of dilute hydrochloric acid was lower than sodium hydroxide, this means that less volume of hydrochloric acid is required to neutralize it, which brings us to the point that hydrochloric acid was more concentrated than sodium hydroxide. So the answer is dilute hydrochloric acid because less volume was used compared to sodium hydroxide. Part D. On the graph, sketch the lines you'd expect to obtain if a copper can was used instead of a polystyrene cup. Polystyrene is a good heat insulator, so there will be less heat lost due to radiation. However, if you use copper, a lot of heat will be lost due to radiation. So overall, the graph will be lower than the polystyrene's graph. But make sure the overall trend is similar to the initial graph. Part E. Give one advantage and one disadvantage of using a beard instead of a measuring cylinder to add the dilute hydrochloric acid directly into the polystyrene cup. The advantage of using a beard is that it's way more accurate, but the disadvantage is that you'll know if you have used these two before. Measuring cylinder takes like 2.5 seconds to use it, but beard takes like 3 minutes. So, it's much slower. Part F. How could the reliability of the results of this investigation be checked? Okay, always remember reliability equals to repeat and compare. So, you have to repeat and compare. Next time, if they ask why do they have to repeat and compare the results, then you write it's to check the reliability. Question 3. Two solids, solid N and solid P, were analyzed. Tests were done on each solid. Tests on solid N. Tests were done and the following observations made. Solid N was dissolved in dusty water to produce solution N. 
The solution was divided into three equal portions and three boiling tubes. Test 1. Aqueous sodium hydroxide was added slowly until in excess to the first portion of solution N. White precipitate was formed and the precipitate dissolved in excess aqueous sodium hydroxide forming a colorless solution. This is a test for cations. I hope you guys have memorized the table and the results. Okay, if you get white precipitate and it dissolves in excess sodium hydroxide, there can be two answers for this. The first one is aluminum and the second one is zinc. We don't know which one it is yet. Let's go to test 2. Aqueous ammonia was added slowly until in excess to the second portion of solution N. White precipitate formed, the precipitate dissolved in excess aqueous ammonia forming a colorless solution. For zinc, same thing if you add ammonia, you get white precipitate and in excess, it's gonna dissolve and form a colorless solution. However, for aluminum, it will not dissolve in excess aqueous ammonia. So this just proved that it's not aluminum and it's just zinc. Task 3. Aluminum foil and aqueous sodium hydroxide were added to the dirt portion of solution and the mixture was heated using a Bunsen burner. Any gas produced was tested with damp red litmus paper. Effervescence was seen, the damp red litmus paper turned blue. This is a test for the presence of nitrate ions, and nitrate is present if ammonia gas is given off. Well, they said that the damp red litmus paper turned blue, and ammonia turns the red paper blue because it's a basic substance. So ammonia was produced, and this proves that nitrate ions are present in the solution. Part A. Name the gas given off in task 3. It's ammonia. Part B. Identify solid N. We have found out everything. It's zinc plus nitrate, so zinc nitrate. Tasks on solid P. Solid P was potassium iodide. Complete expected observations. Describe the appearance of solid P. Potassium iodide, well, you cannot figure this out from the question, you just have to know the color of it. It's white. Part D, a flame test was done on solid P. Since potassium ion is present, it will become lilac. Part E, solid P was dissolved in distilled water to produce solution P. Solution P was divided into three equal portions in three test tubes. About 1 cm depth of dilute nitric acid and a few drops of aqueous silver nitrate were added to the first portion of solution P. This is a test for halide ions, which are chloride, bromide, and iodide ions. Well, we have our iodide here, so the result will be that yellow precipitate will be formed. About 1 cm depth of dilute nitric acid and a few drops of aqueous barium nitrate were added to the second portion of solution P. This is a test for sulfate ions, and if sulfate is present, there will be white precipitate formed, but we don't have any sulfate, so there will be no change. A few drops of aqueous bromine were added to the third portion of solution P. We add bromine to test for the presence of an alkene. If there is alkene, it will turn colorless from brown, but we don't have any alkene here, it's just potassium iodide. So it's just gonna remain brown, or orange, or yellow, but just right brown. Question 4. Stay clean and bright white are two brands of washing powder, both contain sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate is soluble in water and reacts with dilute sulfuric acid to produce carbon dioxide gas. Plan an investigation to determine which of the two washing powders stay clean or bright white contains the greatest percentage of sodium carbonate. You are provided with samples of the two washing powders in common laboratory parts and chemicals. We need to compare the percentage of sodium carbonate and they've told you that it reacts with dilute sulfuric acid and produces carbon dioxide gas. So in order to measure the percentage of sodium carbonate in each washing powder, what you can do is just measure the volume of carbon dioxide gas produced after mixing with dilute sulfuric acid. Then the more carbon dioxide gas produced, the more sodium carbonate there is and 
that washing powder has higher percentage of sodium carbonate. So the method is place each washing powder in a beaker or a flask or a boiling tube and add dilute sulfuric acid to excess. Okay, don't just add a little bit. You have to add as much as possible so that you will get enough carbon dioxide gas to be measured. And then you collect the gas. And how do you collect the gas? We use a gas syringe and you use that to measure the volume of gas and so on. Then the independent variable is that we're using two different types of washing powders. And we have already stated that place each washing powder in a flask. And the variable that needs to be kept constant is that you need to use equal masses of both washing powders. Then the dependent variable is the volume of gas produced. So measure the volume of gas produced in gas syringe. Lastly, you can just state the conclusion that the largest volume of gas produced has most sodium carbonate. It's quite a simple question and there are just few points that you need to write. So this is one mark and adding the acid is another mark. Then in excess is one mark and collect gas and gas syringe is another mark. Then equal masses, measure the volume and the conclusion. So I've actually written eight points. But always make it as a habit to write as many points as possible because you don't know what's in the mark scheme for your paper. Alright, that's it for this paper. If this video helped you, please like and leave a comment to let me know. Subscribe to get ready for your IGCSE exams. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and God bless you guys. Bye.